My name is Keith Veneer. I'm the lead pastor of Grace Fellowship in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we are a, a multi-site church that uh, has three campuses. Um, I've been there for 12 years now, and uh, it's been pretty crazy to see what the Lord has done. I've got the privilege uh, of being there. Uh, this is Travis Smith. Travis is the director of our student ministries uh, over all the campuses um, at Grace and uh, I'm just going to kind of set the stage. Travis is going to give a little bit of logistics, and then uh, we'll get going with what we're going to do this morning. And then hopefully, uh, all of you will feel compelled to come back when we come back after the session and lunch and everything this afternoon to kind of pick up uh, on some stuff. And so, uh, actually, I'll just pause. Travis, you want to give a couple of the logistic things that you need to do? And then we'll sure. Yeah. Thank you guys again for being here. We really, really appreciate it. This is going to be meaningful for you. And, uh, we, we uh, do this because we want to build a bridge between a student ministry and uh, the leadership of your church. And so if you pre-registered the bridge online and you brought your lead pastor, or you were a lead pastor and you were here, then you were eligible for the $2,000 drawing that we're going to do this afternoon when we come back to this room. Uh, we're not going to do it right now, but we'll do it this afternoon. And uh, what we did last year is we gave that $2,000 away. We said that 1000 of it, we suggested that 1000 of it should go to your student ministry. And then if you're a kind person, you should split it with your youth pastor. <laughs> but uh, but that, that's up to you. But as a lead pastor, if you're here and you pre-registered, then you are eligible for that giveaway. Um, so we're excited that you guys are here and we want to get started. Travis will have some things that he'll reference that we do within our student ministry um, that he'll be able to give you some in information on uh, later on. But let me just kind of again build on what he said, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do uh, this morning and this afternoon. Uh, as we get started on that, though, I'm going to pray for us, but I think it's important that um, God really directs us. Let's pray together. God in heaven, we thank you so much for uh, waking us up. Your mercies are new. You are uh, so good, and um, thank you for all that you're already doing here in the conference and in our lives and in our churches and in our families and God, we want to give you all the glory. We want the ministry to always to be about your mission and your name's sake. We pray that all this will be true as we think about the next generation. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I think like a lot of us, uh, we look around at our churches and we see the same challenge that kind of every church faces, and which is that um, how is it that you're going to uh, reach the next generation and really bridge to the next generation to see that you're going to continue to have the gospel move forward in your local church context. It's been said, you know, every local church is one generation away from being really relevant or not existing. Uh, how is it that you make sure that you figure out ways to do that? And um, I started as a lead pastor at Grace when I was 25, one month before I turned 26. I've been there again 12 years now. And so I had a, a unique situation where when I got there, there were about 60 people that called the church home. I would function as the student ministry person during our Sunday school hour. I would preach. I would walk down the hallway, and I would go to the auditorium, and then I would preach to them. So I, I started to kind of navigate that of, of being involved as a young person in the lives of our students and in the lives of uh, kind of our, our normal church. And then our church grew and grew and grew. Uh, now on a given weekend, we have over 3,000 people, and so that obviously doesn't work in terms of how things play out. And I've gotten older, which is taking me away from that generation. We have student ministry staff, volunteers, et cetera, et cetera. How is it that we're going to be able to bridge that gap in nature that is uh, not only I age, but our church age, is how do we continue to reach back and, and grab the next generation? You've probably heard the stat that many people have been bringing up in different contexts. That in the North American context, if you are in suburbia, this is definitely for our Canada, our Canadian brothers and sisters, but for those of us in the States, um, they say that roughly about 40% of the people in your suburban context will consider coming to your church. Uh, about 40%, between 60% won't, 40% will, and they say that on average, that percentage of people who are willing to come to your church shrinks somewhere between a half a percent and a percent a year, which means the idea of people being even interested to come to our church context, hear about who Christ is and all of that stuff, uh, creates some challenges, and so we're going to really kind of bring that up at the end of this, but how do we, how do we bridge, and so here's what I want to do this morning, I want to review for some of you who were in the room last year, most of you weren't, I want to review a little bit of what we do at Grace Fellowship, then in the afternoon what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, no matter whether you're a small church, big church, Canadian church, American church, European church, this is what you struggle with in youth ministry, how is it that we think about answering some of these questions in the scope and in the framework of bridging to the next generation, and then I'm going to leave you with five significant problems that I think every church is going to have to deal with if we're going to bridge to the future. And, uh, and I'm going to warn you, I'm going to write those five things on this 
minuscule, small whiteboard, you're going to want to take a picture of it, and then you're going to want to drive home and begin to be frustrated about what we do with these things, because they're just real, real challenges. Um, as I frame that, I would say that a book that I would recommend every single one of you read is a book called Good Faith by Gabe Lyons and Dave Kinnaman. They're the same two guys that wrote a book in 2007 that many of us read called Unchristian. Unchristian was basically a book where Dave and, and Gabe and the Q Network, if you know that network, phenomenal resource online that I encourage you to use, uh, brilliant stuff. Um, they wrote a book where they said all these back then millennial generation Xers were leaving the church and they said, why? Why are you leaving the church? And the three words that came to mind when they asked those people why they they said the church is judgmental, homophobic, and uh, hypocritical. That's why we don't want to be part of the church. Fast forward nine years later to 2016, and when they think of the church now, the two words that come to mind are extreme and irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so they've written this book to say, how do you do ministry in contexts that are extremely irrelevant to be able to reach the next generation? So even as we're talking about this, um, there's strategies and philosophies, but kind of a good look at the soil to which we're trying to do ministry in. Um, is going to be found in that. So I'm going to start to lay these things out. Travis can feel free to interrupt me as we think about our strategy at Grace Fellowship. Now what I want to do is I want to get through these fairly quickly and then I'm going to try to drive you guys into some conversations. There's a lot of different things strategically that we could do when we think about bridging between our student ministry and our, um, our kind of our church at large. It's the same problem that has existed for years silos where people go through student ministry, then leave, check out, they don't feel like it's their church, they never come back. How do you bridge that? What do you do uh, to try to go after that? I'm going to tell you what we do. It doesn't mean it has to be what you do, but you need to be thinking about it intentionally, strategically to say, are you really trying to solve this problem? Uh, and as I lay these out, I know there's probably going to open up questions. Some of you in student ministry are going to go, there's no way my senior pastor is going to do that. Some of your senior pastors are going to need to go, am I humble enough to hear this from somebody in my student ministry to maybe change some of these things? Uh, and so we're going to lay this out. Travis can give you a few references again on resources that we have and interrupt me. And so this is what we try to do to bridge. I'm going to quickly kind of go through these. Uh, the first thing we would say, I know this whiteboard is like, for ants. So um, I'll write these up here and then you can come back and take a picture. But the first thing that we would say is that we need to have um, weekend services that resonate with the next generation. So we would say, wherever your church is, whatever you're doing, you need to ask yourself, are you creating weekend services as you think about weekend services, if you have, when you have your weekend services, however, if they're weak during the week services in your context, whatever it is, do they actually resonate in a way with the next generation? Um, and a lot of that is a complicated conversation about getting people that are in the generation before to die to self. Some of it is how do you make sure that you uh, are strategically thinking about what it is that they want and how they go after that. But Primarily what motivates this is evangelism to reach the next generation. Uh, and I'm happy to speak to some of the ways that we do that and what that looks like, but here's what I want you to ask right now in your mind, and you're going to end up kind of thinking about this. If you are a, a lead pastor in this room right now, does the average 17-year-old in your church like your weekend service? And I don't mean like like they're like, oh, it's fun. I mean like they feel like they get fed. They feel like they can worship. They feel like they can take a step forward in their faith. They feel like they could invite a friend. And here's what I'm going to tell you right now your 17-year-old doesn't want. Your 17-year-old does not want a junior varsity version of church through their student ministry. Yeah, no, that's they right. don't want it. Those days are gone. The idea that they're going to come and interact with something that is second rate and less... It's like, why would I want to go to the JV version where the person is kind of talking about stuff that makes sense and we play a little bit of games? And, and here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. In a suburban context, particularly like where I'm at, where people, there's income and people are driven and they're busy and they don't have much space on their Legos, if you know that illustration and all that. The reality is people, when they show up for church, they don't go to, um, they don't go to get training to be a better basketball player and, ex and go and... Uh, ask their basketball trainer to play games with them for 20 minutes before they actually do other stuff. When they show up for basketball training, they want basketball training. When they show up for biblical training in church, they want stuff that actually moves them forward. One of the number one things we hear from the next generation behind us is stop treating us like kids. And I don't mean that they're not kids, but they say stop killing time with us. Yeah. 
Bring us into a context where stuff makes sense. And that includes our weekend services. We have to quit pretending that they're going to go to college and want to come back to a weekend service that does not resonate with them. We have to find a way to have. So number one, as a lead pastor, are you secure enough to have that conversation? Number two, if you're a student ministry worker here or a youth pastor here, do you have the guts and honesty and authenticity with your and relationship with your lead pastor to go have that conversation? Because here's what is not tolerable for me between he and I's relationship. I'm not going. I'm going to be very angry and upset and hurt if he has thoughts about what's going on and he's not telling me them, and then he's complaining about them or frustrated with other people. And on the flip side, he should be very frustrated and concerned with me if I wouldn't ask him, "Are we helping his ministry?" And so, a lot of the problem with this bridge, let's just be frank, is our relationship between our lead pastors and our student ministries is not as honest and as healthy as it needs to be. Yeah. So we need to have some real conversations about uh, what that looks like. The second thing that we've made a huge decision in our ministry with students about is about groups. Um, we don't have a large gathering student ministry uh, like weekend service for our senior high students. We don't. So 9th through 12th graders, if they are going to worship on the weekend in a service, they come to our service. They don't come to something on their own. And then the way they have community and the way they take their next steps in discipleship and ministry is they have to get in a group. Groups are the fundamental baseline part of our student ministry from, from 7th grade on. And here's the thing I'll tell you. We're a big enough church. We have the resources to pull off a pretty good weekend show for our students if we wanted to. But we don't. We want to drive them back to number one so that they feel like it's their church. And then we want to put them in groups where they have the dynamic to grow on a deeper level with one another and actually do ministry and community uh, together. Um, number three, we would say that it's also really crucial that we figure out how to get students, particularly high school students, serving in our churches as soon as possible. So one of the reasons we don't have weekend stuff for our students outside of their groups is because we want them to attend a service and serve in a service. So we want them to serve in our children's ministry. We want them to serve with maybe other junior high students. We want them to serve in our cafe. We want them to serve at the front doors. We want them to serve in the parking lot. We want them to serve in the band. If our high school students are good enough to play in our band for big service, they do. They do. And so we want them to serve. Why? 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 Because this makes it we, not them. Yeah. Makes it we. It's their church. They're a part of it. It's not the student ministry. They're a part of us. Mm -hmm. They're a part of everything that goes on with us. And so when you show up and you walk the halls of Grace Fellowship, one of the things that you'll be shocked to see is it's like, wow, they got a lot of students doing a lot of things. I'll be frank. If our student ministry came and said, we're going to pull them out of that, our ministries would suffer greatly. Because they're in the nurseries, they're in the toddler rooms, they're with the junior high students, they're in the parking lots, they're in the bank. And why? Because then when they come home at college, then when they come back after college, it's somewhere they already feel like they own and feel like they're a part of and they serve and connect with. Right? Am I making sense with that? So they're involved in that and then they own that. Number four. Do you want to add anything? Any no, no, I, I think in, in the reason that we focus on this is because we think discipleship is the key. We think that, that getting students disciples is more important than having a big party group. We think that if you're going to put them, if they're going to have a relationship, whether, you're, whether you've got 10 kids here today or whether you've got 1,000 kids, it doesn't really matter. Every kid needs to know Jesus and every kid needs to have a relationship with an adult. And you, you've got to get focused on discipleship. It's about taking them to the next step of that process. It's not about just giving them some sort of party to go to. They've got to be, they've got to be a group. They've got to get real. Jesus teaches how important it is for us to serve. We gotta get our kids serving in our churches. And we gotta get them belonging to something that, that they feel proud of and they can invite something to. Next one that we do is we really focus on out of groups, how do we get the right kids with mentors, with mentorship. So uh, it doesn't happen with every student in our student ministry for sure. But the kids that we would say are fat, uh, that sounds terrible, but it's an acronym. 
faithful, available, teachable. You've probably heard that before. Faithful, available, teachable people. When we find students that are faithful, available, and teachable, students that want to go to the next level, students that are committed to weekend services, committed to groups, and committed to serving, um, we find mentors for them. Sometimes they're a grace group leader, sometimes another student ministry leader, sometimes someone on staff, but we make sure that we are finding ways to take these people who are our brightest, young, future people, we bridge back to them through mentorship. And it's a commitment. So we tell our student ministry workers, part of the thing that you're going to do if you're a student ministry staff person with us, you're going to work with people. You're going to work with other students. Like one-on-one, one-on-two, or one-on-three. You're going to have your group, your 12, and then you're going to have your three, your Peter, James, and John, right? You're going to go below, and you're going to do that. And so we expect this. We expect people to know that not every student is going to be mentored. Not every student's fat. A lot of students are busy playing travel, whatever. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. But the ones that are faithful, the ones we can we make sure that we mentor and we figure out how to get it. And the last thing, and this, is, this has been revolutionary for us, and I'll tell you where it came from, and it's been really, really helpful. We try to get our best, I don't know other ways to say it, most talented disciplers in student ministry. <clears throat> There's a church in Columbus, Ohio called Zenos Christian Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Kind of a different church. They're very, very good. By the way, if I'm walking funny or look funny or I'm leaning on stuff or stretching, I tore my Achilles tendon four months ago. I had to have surgery, and so it still just is annoying. <laughs> um, so if I'm up here and you hear me, like, why does he keep pressing like he's trying to drive a car fast? It's because I'm cracking my foot. I apologize for that. We, I read this article from their church that they had on their website, and I forget exactly what it was called, but it was something like, 49 reasons your church will never be like our church. And one of the things that it said in the article was, um, we put our best most talented disciplers with two groups of people, college students and high school students. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's the age where people are making the most formative decisions for the future of their life and what they're going to do and how that's going to play out. And so we want the best people in our church, our elders, the most equipped, the most spiritual, most people that really, really get it. Not even to be necessarily investing in 40-year-olds or 50-year-olds or 60 year olds Not even, but to be with high school students and college students. So there's somewhere between 4,000 people, 5,000 people that attend our church. Um, I don't do a small group as the lead pastor of the church for adults. The only small group I lead in the church is a, church, is a small group that my wife and I lead for high school seniors. It's the only small group I lead. Not another Bible study with some potential future leaders in the church that kind of happens, but the most consistent group of people that I pour into are the high school seniors. In fact, I uh, taught at our young adult summer um, ministry called Commons. I uh, preached there, not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday before. And there were about 140 students there, 18 to 25. And I looked out as I was preaching, and I told one of them this yesterday. I got pretty emotional about it. Because I looked at, and over half of them at some point have been in a group of my wife and I. Mm -hmm. Now here's what happens. When they start to make decisions of, well, Grace Fellowship might not be relevant enough for me, or I see another church in town that's got better social media than us, or I'm not sure what my future's going to be, or I'm really talented and I want a job right now and you're not willing to give me a job, here's what happens in almost every single one of those situations. Because I have a relationship with them and I'm their pastor and I've been their pastor the whole time, mm -hmm. they come and talk to me. So it's not that they're going to go back to their youth pastor and say, this is why our church is lame. What should I do next? What happens is my wife and I get relational anchors in those young people, and they become a part of our church. And as they make decisions, they filter that through the fact that they're in relationship with us. So uh, over the last, like, you know, four or five years, I mean, I've had... Um, I've had basically over, because I, we, we actually pair the list down, I've had over 100 seniors in my group. And before that, before I went and did seniors, the first four years before that when I was doing groups, um, I made the decision I was only going to do groups with young adults. So I haven't done an adult small group as a lead pastor of Grace Fellowship for nine years. Every small group I've done in the last nine years has been for 30-year-olds and under. Why? Because we believe if we can put the best, most talented people at, and so we, we direct people that way. One of our elders works in junior high and teaches all the time. Some of our core staff and volunteers work with our students so we can connect them and it's their church. Want to comment on anything else? Like that? The, the thing that you have to think about if you're, if you're a, a youth pastor in the room, or even if you're a lead pastor, this is just the idea of giving that ministry away, constantly giving it away. 
So we have a pretty large, a significant large group that's here this week, and my team is on it. There, there are so many things happening in the rooms at night here when we're in a place like this. Uh, when we're back home, we have, we have real situations happening with our students, and we have a leadership team that cares for our kids so much that sometimes things will happen, and I don't even know about it because I'm not hands-on with the students. Yeah. I'm hands-on with these leaders. I'm recruiting the best people in our church, and I've, I've just got this kind of weird, weird ability to just kind of seek people out, or maybe if, I, if I've trained myself to do this. But I walk around on church, at church on Sunday mornings, and I look for people who I think, I'm just watching that person. It's kind of weird and stalkish-like, right? But I'm just <laughs> checking out this person, and I'm going there. I can tell that person. Young people like that person. They're drawn to them. I'm going to do some reconnaissance work back here and figure out, make sure that they're walking with Jesus and making sure that they're a person you know who has character. And then I'm going to go approach that person. We're going to go get coffee together. Then I'm going to tell them, you know what? You're going to work with our students. And then I'm going to recruit that person. I'm going to get them a group and, and I'm going to give the ministry away. Now they are the youth pastors. So with these groups that we create, we don't have a youth pastor. We have like 60 youth pastors. Mm -hmm. And they all have their own little flock, and it works so well. I'm walking around here at Momentum, and I'm running into my leaders, and they're doing such an incredible job. And I'm not doing anything. I'm just checking in with them, but because we're giving, we're giving it away to them, and we're letting them be owners, and they're teaching our students how to be followers of Jesus in a real way, in a way that I can't even do. Yeah, and we, when we hired Travis, the irony was, um, we said as a, as a group of different person, we said. We joked, we don't want hot, pack, hot, hot pants of Johnny. And what we meant by we don't want hot pants of Johnny was we don't want the guys that all the students fall in love with, and that's their youth ministry is the guy. Yeah. We wanted someone who was going to multiply themselves to other leaders so that we had a plethora of student ministry leaders rather than one guy that the ministry rose and fell upon. We didn't want a person where they would show up and say, I want to come on Wednesday night to hang out with Hot Pants Johnny, and then when I go to Ohio State and I come back, I want to still hang out with Hot Pants Johnny. We said, no, we want you to connect with our student ministry people who are a part of our church. And so the goal when we hired Travis was not to find the guy, it was to find a guy who would multiply himself through men and women into the hearts and lives of our students. So our students, when they come here, they don't think about student ministry being any different because at home, the student ministry isn't about Travis. It's about the team that's been built, and we've intentionally built that team, and then we've intentionally connected that team to say, how does it do this to bridge backwards all the way to where those people are pushing them to our services that make sense for an 18-year-old? It makes sense for a 16-year-old. I can't tell you how many people have come up to their, their parents have come to me and said, hey, the reason we decided to stay at church, the reason we decided to stay at Grace was the ministry here that you were having on the weekends resonated with my teenagers. Mm -hmm. And then those students get built into the hearts of our church and they move forward in such a way again that when they serve, it becomes we and not them. And then when they come back, they're deeply connected. Okay. And I'll say this too. If you're here and you go, well, that's great, but you guys have a big church and you guys got a lot of groups and you guys have those kind of resources or whatever. And you go, we only have 10 kids in our, in our church or whatever. Well, maybe, maybe you, don't, you, don't, you don't have the kids or the, the amount of students to go you know, create a bunch of small groups. And, or maybe you've got some students who are in 12th grade and some who are in 7th grade, and you're like, I can't put them all in a group together because they're just, you know, they're, the margins are so big across how big they are. Well, maybe maybe think a bit different. Just go, okay, well, i got 10 kids that go to my church, or 15 or whatever. That means I need 15 relevant adults to go do one-on-one -on -one discipleship with each kid. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a there's a different way to do it based on the size of your church. Just because you don't have a you know a giant student ministry doesn't mean that you have to have to do it the same way we do. You can say, well, the fact that we have fewer people is actually a, a plus. That means we can we can create a relationship, one-on-one -on -one relationship with every kid in our church. Now the, the hard part, I'm, maybe I'm not looking for group leaders, maybe I'm looking for one-on-one -on -one mentors, and I want to give every kid a mentor because we've only got 20 kids. The last thing I'll say about this, and then I'm going to uh, give a chance for questions and we're going to transition to something else. What this has done for us, this last one, number five, is it's made those people who are leaders in our church um, better preachers, better leaders, better missionaries of the yeah. culture because it forces them to stay connected to the next generation. Yeah. So what happens when I'm leading a small group with high school seniors every week is I'm being forced to contextualize the high school seniors because I'm listening to them talk. So I'll just say to them sometimes, my wife and I'll say to them, hey, what's the most popular show y'all are watching? 
What's the, what's the app that you guys are using more than any other app? What's the thing that's driving the conversation at school these days? What do you guys really think about homosexual marriage? I, and I have free audience into this next generation's hearts and minds to be able to take that and shape it into our weekend services. Which, by the way, then affects my ability when I'm preaching to their parents on how their parents can be effective to them. Because it's making me stay, and I tell them this, it's one of the very first things I say in one of the very first gatherings with them. You guys are helping me stay younger. Tell them that. You're helping our church stay healthy and younger. By on purpose us investing in you guys and making okay. Let me pause. Here's what I want to do because we've got about 20-ish minutes left. I want to just take a couple minutes for questions. Hold on, buddy. A couple minutes for questions. After that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to break up into some groups. And when I want you to break up into groups, I don't want you to be with someone from your church. I want you to go in a different environment, in a different uh, world. And what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'll coach up when you get there, is I want you to look at these five, and I want you to ask, what's the one you really think you need to go back and fight for? What's the one that you go, I, we got to change, we got to address? And the reason I don't want you to be in groups is maybe you're the youth staff person and your lead pastor's here and you're not really comfortable telling them that yet. <laughs> but I want you to be honest in the group right now. We'll do it in a second. And I want you to say, which one of these five do you say we must go back and put a larger emphasis on? We must get better. Maybe you're already doing groups, but you hear this and go, we got to shatter it. We need to do it better. We need to make it more important. Okay, I'll emphasize that quickly, about three, three-ish minutes questions about these that you hear yeah. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. That you do. I know you guys have talked about this, and I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate this. One of the biggest obstacles I find in communicating vision with people at large in our church, or even leadership, is the, the conversation about margin in students' lives. And so sometimes what I get is, well, we just need to have a plethora of things available to students. Um, in terms of events, youth groups, small groups. Everyone's a fan of small groups, but to actually make that an emphasis seems to be an obstacle for people because they want, they want small groups and big groups every week. Yeah. So I, I have seen the little, little margin we have in the students' lives, but that's difficult to communicate sometimes to people. So how are you guys doing that? Yeah, we, we actually had this conversation, obviously, and we, we decided this. I'm going to boil down a lot of conversations in prayer to this. Um, we said we're going to force people to choose what they prioritize. So we said we're not going to have small groups every single day. We're not going to create an environment for them later. Most of our small groups are on Sunday nights. That's just kind of what it is. It's kind of how it plays out for, for junior high and senior high. And we basically came to this conclusion, and I just I think it's true. Even if you gave that con sort of consumeristic approach, it will create all the different times because we've markets, many of those kids still wouldn't come. Right. It's not a priority for their parents, and it's not a priority for them. So we said, we're gonna, this is what we're going to do. Our job is to clearly communicate when and why, what we're doing, when and why. And we're just going to say that ultimately people are going to have to make choices. But I don't have any problem. I mean, those of you that are connected to our ministry know this about me, and Travis would verify this. I will have no problem getting up on the platform this weekend and saying, if you're a parent and you didn't prioritize momentum in the life of your child this week, you made a mistake. You made a bad decision. And I'll say that. If you're not prioritizing group life for your kid, you're making a mistake. And a lot of that is just, you know, we, I'm a college athlete. I played basketball here at Cedarville. I'm a college athlete. So I understand the value of athletics in my life. Um, and in the life that I have a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, 2-year-old, almost 2-year-old twins, my 10-year-old plays travel soccer, but we have certain rules. We've had to line up in our home. He gets to go away on one term in a year. He's got to always be at church every weekend. There's just certain things that we've set are the rules and how it plays out. And we're just more and more to the reality of um, we need to say to parents, these are the ground rules. This is the commitment. It's either going to happen or not happen. But we're not going to accommodate the consumer culture. And in our context, we have three campuses with seven services. Figure it out. <laughs> like, you know, you have six services between two campuses over the course of two days within 20 minutes of each other. You can make church if you want to make church. Yeah. Talking about parents, uh, you know, all throughout scripture you see that you've got to tell mom and dad to be the primary disciple. Yeah. Yep. How do you guys uh, navigate that? You know, that the, <coughs> the God gives other voices into the yep. lives of so the ministry, which 
this, yeah. this afternoon, this we're going to go after some of that. Because yeah. I think every single one of us would say um, the huge challenge in all of this is that ultimately the primary disciples are mom and dad. What do we do? Because we're a program, they're the parents, how do we have it? So we're going to cover some of that this afternoon. Yeah. Yes? Um, what is your turnover time in, in your discipleship groups, like, or in your small groups? Like, do you allow them, like, if they have friends that are, like, deciding to seek the Lord, like, can they bring these people in? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our, our groups are open. Um, we, we say that there's, like, that, that there's a sweet spot. Between 10 and 15 students is a good size group. We've had some groups that are larger, and we have we have some leaders that just they're just working magic. We have no idea, but they're bringing kids in, and like we'll we'll take their group and we'll strategically take one set of students and we'll send a leader and we'll break into two different groups. Um, but then that group will just fill itself back up. We have we have a few situations, but for the most part, between ten and fifteen, we say is a pretty solid group. Um, but those are open groups, so we we bring kids in. We we encourage them to have an invitation culture. We want the groups to be basically like having a small church on Sunday nights. And then, and then, help. And yeah. then about and then about once every six weeks, okay. there's an event that is called Connect. And the whole purpose of it is it, it sort of doubles between a, a ministry effort and a service. So like um, all the students are invited to come to it and then to bring their friends. And a lot of times out of like one year, one event they did was like a food packing event for a ministry to serve. Yeah. Well, what we found is that the students actually like coming together, serving together in that kind of event, more than they like even attending another service. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of that event is if I have a friend, Dave, to come with me, to connect with my other people at the ministry, at Grace, and then there our hope is that they'll get moved from that and get plugged into a group. So that happens throughout the year as well. Can I go with that real quick? Um, so we live in a day and age of just protecting our teams. Sure. And uh, you know, they're minors. How do you guys walk out, you know, uh, not, just, not from a legal standpoint, but for a, a, a protection of, of the kids, you know, because you've got youth with adults or college age, do you guys have to do like a few-person rule, or yes. how do you walk yeah. out? You mean like with, with, with our, our the teachers, teachers, do they meet at, like at, on campus? They, they no, no, they, they meet, our groups meet in homes, okay. and, uh, and we always have two leaders that meet together. We, have, we uh, don't have co-ed groups at the moment. We've got groups that are just specifically gender specific. Yeah. Uh, we have two leaders that are always there at all times, and those leaders are background checked. Those leaders run through our training. Um, these are people that we know and we trust and we've, we've met with several times. And we also are moving, we'll talk about this this afternoon, we're also moving to a place to where we are, we are making sure that every leader connects with every parent so that way there is a personal connection and a relationship there to avoid things like that. And again, you know, no traveling with the opposite sex alone. I mean, there's all the senior stuff that right. we would think of. Well, you know, I mean, traveling with like, one guy taking another guy yeah. out. Like, yeah, sure, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. How do you balance resonating with the next generation yeah. with the older generation? Yeah, the biggest thing that I can say to that, and it's a long conversation, I'm happy to talk about it more, mm -hmm. kind of as we're vaccine or whatever, but is the older generation has to be brought to the place of this is about mission and vision and reaching people, and so they'll die to so it's constantly about saying, do you want your grandkids to be part of a great church? And if the answer to that is yes, then you've got to give some, you got to give some stuff up. And it's not that we don't love you, we don't buy you, we don't want to create for you, but the heart of the conversation is about mission. It's about mission. It's about vision. And helping them sometimes understand some sociological things that trends change faster. And you know, it's just a different world that it's not as um, morality in churches is as important as it once was in our culture and all these things. And so we have to kind of do things different as we're pushed to the margins of society. And, but the biggest thing is mission and vision. And I can tell you, I've had those conversations in my office or over coffee or in Bob Evans hundreds of times with lots of people. I think the music's too loud. Let me tell you why the music is too loud. I hear you. And there are times where it, it's going to feel too loud. But this generation loves anonymity with a path to community. And one of the places they love anonymity is when they show up for music. They don't care about the harmony three parts down or two parts over or three rows in front of them or three rows behind them. They want to be able to have a time with just them and just their space with anonymity until they feel like they're connected. And so we need to create an environment that drives anonymity. I've done that a few times. And so you have to have those conversations over and over and over about mission and vision and mission and vision and mission and vision. And so to the point where like I'm explaining to someone on a napkin 
this is what we run our decibels at, and this is what unsafe decibel levels are, and this is what they used to be run at, and here's what it goes. And so we run around 90, and normally 110 is unsafe, and what it, and like I've explained that, and all of that is mission and vision, and I've looked at people and said, when you look around and you hear that we had 150 students go to Momentum and 30 of them gave their life to Jesus, and part of that is because of the context of the church that we create, aren't you grateful for that? Well, then I don't argue with that. And there's a point where if they're not, like, this is just hard, but there's a point where if they're not mature enough to deal with that, you have to choose who you lose. You can't be everything to all people because you become nothing to anybody. You have to set a goal. You have to set a perimeter. And my personal opinion is a lot of lead pastors know that we're just afraid. We're just scared. And ultimately, we have to say it isn't about our salaries. It isn't about our people. It isn't about our sheep. We just have to make decisions on what we think is mission. And so Travis has heard me say that. Megan and Aaron have heard me say this. We make decisions about mission before anything. We're not going to be governed by fear. We drive that conversation. One more question, and then i got to move to think that real quick. Um, you said groups are your strategy for discipleship. Yep. What is your process of walking through um, you know, unsafe, not having anything to do with that's, yeah. a great, that's a great question. I brought two resources and we'll go we'll go over those a little bit more this afternoon if you guys come back. We created a student manual. Uh, it's been about two years in the making. Um, we have a digital copy that we're that we're gonna have available for you guys. And if you are interested this afternoon, I'll get you to write your, your emails down. I can give you a digital copy. It kind of talks, it, it's the, this is what I give to every student leader that's a potential leader. I'll give them this and I'll make them read through it. And this is this is basically our DNA. It's how we work. It's what I expect of them. It's everything that you just talked about from safety to creating those environments um, to what I expect, what my expectations are. And then this is a book by Dan Spader called The Four Chair Disciple, Four Chair Discipleship. We adopted this book a year and a half ago for our student ministry, and now our whole church uses this for our entire group model, adults, uh, young adults, and student ministry. And it, it's a discipleship path book. It's basically, it talks about how to, how to identify a student or, or an individual or yourself and put yourself in a category. Basically, it's a four-chair process. So chair one is the lost. Chair four is I'm, I'm going to go make Multiply. more disciples. Yep, and so this book will walk you through it. This is what we use to get all of our leaders to walk through that process. So that, that book helps frame it, and then there's just different aspects in our church that are gonna drive that conversation. But one of the things is, um, as you're looking for fat people, it's less about them having spiritual, I know it's a funny sentence, you know, Pokemon Go for fat people instead of Pokemon Go. Um, as, you're, as you're playing this game, looking for fat people is less about how much they know and how long they've been in church, and more about looking for people who are just hungry and want to take the next step. And so I would say we're going to identify this person. It isn't about how long they've been in our church. It's just about are they showing the desire to learn and grow and be better. And if this person can get in this, that's where this real spiritual growth is going to happen. You really want to move a person from this to this, and once you move them from this to this, it's going to happen. All right, I need to stop. I'll, we'll come back and we'll have a chance for questions after. Here's what I want you to do. Break down into groups uh, between three to five. I don't care. Do it fairly quickly. When you get into the group, again, I prefer you don't do it with someone from your church. I want you to ask yourself, what is it that you need to focus on on one of these five and then to tell that group why? So I'm going to ask you to talk ministry shop with some strangers. All right? So I want you to do that. We'll do that for about 10 minutes and then I'll put a bow on this this morning. Say a couple things to be done. We'll leave this up here. You can take a, a you know, grab like a screenshot of it so that you're uh, take a picture of it so you have it to think about. Whatever you just said to the person or persons in your group, here's what I'm asking you to say that you'll really do in your soul. That if that is the thing that you know you need to go back and address with your church, you will prayerfully think about a plan of what you're going to do, do to go do that. My heart for coming here and being a part of this time with you all is not so we would talk about ideas and not do anything about it. It's not my heart at all. My heart is we would take what we're thinking about and actually figure out how to put it in practice and do something about it. So whatever that single thing is, I'm not asking you to try to solve all five of these overnight, but I'm asking that whatever one you would say, you would prayerfully seek God, seek wisdom, seek counsel, and say, um, I'm really going to try to go spearhead this in my church, number one. Number two, part of the reason our circumstance at Grace works is because of the relationship between Travis and I. 
If you are a lead pastor, you have to cultivate the relationship with your other staff in this regard to be able, listen to me, to create ministry doors that are open, not just relational doors that are open. Lots of staffs are allowed to talk about marriage and kids and the sporting event and the calves and all that. No, no, no. That's great. But you need ministry doors that are open where you, they can walk in and say, your sermon was kind of lame this week. Your illustrations are way outdated. There, you have permission to go talk to your children's ministry like Travis does with our director of children's ministry and say, we must figure out a better transition from 6th grade to 7th grade. You have to have your ministry doors open or else your staff is going to operate in silos. And so for some of you that are lead pastors, you need to take your, your junior high, your senior high ministry leaders out to lunch, get to know them and say, I'm letting my guard down. You have permission to blast. Go. Some of you that are complaining need to stop complaining and go seek a conversation. You're not helping the kingdom by complaining about it. Go have a talk. Do not ever hold your senior pastor accountable for something that you never told them. It's not fair. It's not fair. I say to my wife all the time, I cannot read your thought bubbles. I don't know what you're saying, sweetheart. You didn't say it. The same thing is true in the ministry context. So uh, please take what you're going to do. Think about it. Number two, make sure that you pursue relationships. And the third thing I'll say is Travis and I want to do whatever we can to help you however we can. That's not a sound bite, that's reality. If you said, hey, from this, I would really love to get some time with Travis, or I'd love to be able to have a conversation with Keith about this, all I can tell you is we'll do everything we can to try to make that happen. Um, I speak tomorrow night here, and so I'm going to be around for two days. You may see me in a hallway or see me in the cafeteria. And come grab me and say, can I have a Don't grab me, talk to me, and say, hey, can I have a few minutes? <laughs> um, and I also want to let you know, I don't say to come to us because... Um, we have it all figured out. We don't. We're dialoguing to try to figure it out. And you may have a better idea than ours. And we want to hear that. So this afternoon, what we do when we come back, is we're going to talk about five things that plague every student ministry. And then we're going to talk about how those things, how what's one thing we clearly can do to actually help them actually be bridges to the next generation. And you're going to help us with that because we're going to break down the groups and do that. And then at the end, I'm going to make everybody sad. And I'm going to talk about some of the biggest challenges that are facing all of us as we move into the next generation. And so I really hope that you'll make the time uh, to come back, to be a part of that. Um, I'll tell you what, Scott, would you just pray for us as we close in? That would be awesome. God, thanks for this opportunity. What a joy to be, why you choose to use us. Uh, and we're humble. So God, we want to we do it your way. So thank you for this opportunity for us to dialogue with people who are like-minded and have the same passions. Thank you for these men and their willingness to just be vulnerable and open with us. God, we do this for your honor and your glory because of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us. There's too much at stake for us to be lazy, for us to not work hard and to not be creative. Just follow your example. It's in Jesus' name.